Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us today. We're excited to have Nathan Bouchant Mustapaga and Scott Harold from the RAND Corporation with us for the release of our new special report. Uh, Scott and Nathan will be looking at Chinese analysis of North Korean ballistic missile tests. Um, we're very excited to sort of get into this new area, something that's not talked a lot about in terms of North Korea and its capabilities, um, what the Chinese actually, uh, how they view North Korea's program. Um, for those of you who um, are with us today, you should have received uh, both Scott and Nathan's bios, but very briefly, uh, Nathan is a policy analyst at the RAND Corporation where he focuses on Asian security issues. Scott Harold is a senior political scientist at RAND and an affiliate faculty member at the Pardee RAND Graduate School. He specializes in foreign and defense policies of China, Japan, North Korea, South Korea, and Taiwan. Um, we will be taking, and as usual, uh, asking for questions from the audience. So please feel free to take and use the Q&A function uh, in the Zoom uh, settings. And with that, I'd like to turn things over to Scott. Thanks very much, Troy. And uh, thanks, Troy and KEI, for publishing our piece and for giving us up the opportunity to talk about it. Uh, I'd also like to express my, and I'm sure also Nathan's, uh, gratitude to the Korea Foundation uh, for providing funding that allowed us to do this study. Uh, and a big congratulations to Nathan, my co-author, who both conceptualized the study and did most of the heavy lifting on the piece and who you'll be hearing from shortly uh, for much of the research. Um, so the, the basic question uh, that we sought to explore with this paper is, you know, what does China think about North Korea's ballistic missile development? Is it worried by the increasing range, complexity, delivery platforms, penetration aids, and other dimensions of North Korea's program? Is it indifferent? Uh, and if it's indifferent or not worried, um, why is that? It's a, a complicated uh, or confusing position to hold, given that there's a very difficult relationship between Pyongyang and Beijing. Uh, you know, Chinese uh, grand strategy has long been described uh, since a peace on Christensen in foreign affairs in 1996 is kind of practicing at the high or worshiping at the high church of realpolitik. Uh, and so from our IR theory backgrounds, we all know that that means you should worry primarily about uh, capabilities and intentions, but not only the political relationship, definitely the capabilities should be seen as worrisome. And of course, uh, those of us who watch Korea know that Jong uh, Ang for example, at the time of Kim Jong-il's uh, passing, reported shortly thereafter that they had obtained uh, access to his last instructions, uh, the first of which was never stop building nuclear weapons and ballistic missiles, but not that far down the list was never forget that the country that has bullied Korea the most in its history is China. Of course, we also know that uh, Kim Jong-un had referred to Xi Jinping as a bastard and has accused the CCP of betraying socialism. So given all this, the political relationship doesn't provide a lot of reasons to believe that these two countries uh, are great close friends, uh, and therefore China shouldn't be at ease based on the political relationship alone. So then we started to think, well, how could we explore this question? One way, certainly, and it's a way that's been explored before, would be to look at how Chinese analysts uh, write and talk about North Korea and the China-North Korea relationship. Uh, but that field has already been well explored. Uh, so Nathan and I decided to try a different tack, looking in detail at some of the writings as well as the sources of information employed by PRC technical analysts of North Korea's uh, military, and in particular looking at the ballistic missile component of the KPA. Uh, perhaps these analysts assess North Korea's capabilities differently than U.S. and other Western or uh, free world scholars do. Uh, we decided to find out. We started, of course, uh, by creating a baseline. Uh, that baseline was uh, premised on the open source analysis provided by the U.S. Department of Defense, uh, the ROK Pukbangbu, or Ministry of National Defense, uh, and Japan's uh, Boesho, or the Ministry of Defense. Uh, we also supplemented that with open source intelligence analyses and writings by U.S. experts and others, such as Jeffrey Lewis, uh, who track these issues professionally or out of personal uh, interest. Uh, we then supplemented that with a very limited number of discussions in Tokyo and in Seoul uh, with experts uh, from the United, uh, sorry, from Japan and South Korea who are specialists on North Korea, uh, 
Uh, and those formed the baseline of our study and will be the point of comparison that Nathan will speak to as he unfolds what we found out when we started looking into the question of how do PRC authors uh, assess North Korean missile development. So Nathan, uh, with that, I'll turn it over to you and you can talk a bit more about kind of what you found uh, or what we found when we looked in detail at those writings. Great, thanks Scott. So I'm gonna start sharing my screen. I think that should be sharing now. And just to you know, follow up on Scott, I wanna say thank you to KI for publishing and hosting us today with our new report. And to second Scott's thanks to uh, the Korea Foundation for supporting this research. Uh, we're gonna talk a little bit today about this baseline of foreign assessments, how China and Chinese analysts think about North Korean missiles by comparison, uh, and then what really we can actually draw from these assessments. Uh, what's original, how they play into Chinese policy process, uh, if they actually contribute anything new to our broader understanding of North Korean missiles, and what this means for overall study of China and Korea and Northeast Asian security. So uh, this is just a map from a 2019 US government publication showing that uh, North Korean missiles obviously have a very long range and ICBMs can indeed reach uh, the United States, which reflects the broader US government uh, assessment um, you know, for last several years of North Korean missiles, especially with the Hwasong-15 ICBM test. Uh, there's also an assessment that uh, solid-fueled Pukuk Song 2 MRBM, which is developed from an SLBM uh, over the last couple years, is progressing as a viable deterrent. Uh, and this analysis by the U.S. government, most importantly for our research here, is actually confirmed by the interviews that Scott mentioned and broader writings across U.S. and non-U.S. experts, uh, with some important caveats over questions for North Korea's ability to do reentry vehicles and their oper operational reliability. Uh, but as Scott said, you know, looking at this writing and reading 38 North and others, you know, we really realized that the big missing piece here was how Chinese analysts think about these things, whether they could add anything to the conversation. So when we looked at the available literature sources, on the left, we're showing you uh, all the articles by type of missiles discussed on North Korea over what we could find in the Chinese literature. And so what you see is there was a spurt in the late 90s uh, driven by the first uh, Teperon test. There was a lull in the early 2000s with a little bit of a pickup um, in the late 2000s, greater attention starting in you know, 2010 or so. Uh, and then obviously with more North Korean uh, high profile testing over the last several years, there's been an increase in that. Uh, and really actually reading those roughly 40 to 50 articles, what we found is that early research uh, and writing on North Korean systems by Chinese analysts in the late 90s was kind of a catch up moment for them where they really poured through, distilled and largely mirrored American assessments, mainly US government publications, testimony to Congress, uh, NIEs that were discussed uh, and did not have much disagreement or really new information to provide in those assessments. Uh, in the 2000s, you know, as you see here, there was a lull and what was discussed uh, seems kind of diplomatically constrained. And this also reflects this broader relationship at the time between China and North Korea, that another journal uh, that had an article critical of the Kim family regime in China was actually closed out of pressure from Pyongyang to Beijing and Beijing caved to that pressure. And so what you see is that when there are articles by Chinese analysts talking about global missile developments, they completely ignore the fact that North Korea has a missile program. They don't talk about anything related to the nominally space launches they're conducting uh, in, the early, in the mid 2000s and later on miraculously start talking about these programs. Uh, so it's not that they didn't know that they were going on or that they were actually ignoring them, just it seems that they really weren't talking about them in the literature. And then what we're going to cover more later on is what we actually see is a more robust monitoring effort uh, starting in the early 2000s for North Korean missile activity. But we should frame this as part of a larger monitoring effort for global missile developments that was not uniquely really attuned to North Korea most of the time. And so looking at these articles, the big conclusion we draw from the overall scope is that a lot of China's attention on the Korean Peninsula 
and North Korean missiles is not actually from uh, North Korean missiles themselves, but really the risk they bring of a US initiated war on the peninsula. So it's really the frame that Beijing and Chinese defense community brings for North Korean missiles. Uh, looking at the overall assessment of uh, how China thinks of North Korean missiles, we have uh, two good articles, which also shows you the dearth of quality analysis on the Chinese side that cover the Hwasong series of tests in 2016 and 2017. Uh, and fundamentally, yes, they agree with, the, with US assessments that Hwasong 15 was what they call North Korea's first real ICBM and what they call, quote, an engineering miracle uh, for North Korea that it could strike the US. So let's get that out of the way. Yes, they agree with the fact that these missiles are real, that they work, uh, that they likely work, uh, and that they do have the range to actually hit CONUS. Uh, but they have a different opinion on other things. They seem skeptical on North Korea's ability to do warhead miniaturization because when they actually talk about the ranges, they usually talk about the lower end of what the US analysts would assess as full ranges for North Korean missiles. Uh, nominally, this is because they're rating, they're assuming that the warhead is heavier, which means less range. But you could also take a more cynical perspective and say, well, this is just really an excuse to downplay North Korean missile ranges. And because we weren't able to actually talk to any of these analysts, uh, we can't really know for certain. But uh, of the two explanations, you know, it, it seems that either one is viable. And the second thing they're skeptical about is the fact that uh, North Korean warheads, due to their heat shield performance, may actually have a limited range. So the, the actual utility of a North Korean missile, one author argued could be limited to 3,000 kilometers, which is actually far short of ICBM range. I think one of the more interesting fundamental differences of opinion that we drew from these Chinese writings is that they seem to have a lower bar for North Korean operational reliability, uh, but also technical prowess. So they also kind of agree with the US that the MRBM uh, Pukuklong 2 is indeed a promising North Korean platform for deterrence because it's solid fueled, which means it's more uh, mobile within the North Korean kind of mountainous area where they like to keep their uh, missiles. But they're very skeptical on all of the ICBMs in the North Korean arsenal for various technical issues. Again, that could just be geopolitical posturing and downplaying capability or actually reflecting a different technical assessment of North Korean missile capabilities. Uh, and then lastly, looking into the future on the North Korean arsenal, now that they've developed quite a broad range of missiles, Chinese analysts actually include missiles that I think most American experts would assume are kind of OBE that are outdated for the overall capability range. So they still think that the Musadong, even the Tepanong 2 and the Kano 8 would be part of the North Korean arsenal for another 10 years, which I think is different than most American experts. Looking forward, Chinese analysts expect the North Korea will remain focused on liquid fuel missiles because that's what they're already good at, so they're comfortable with. Uh, they expect North Korea to at some point conduct a full range ICBM test in order to have better confidence in the operational reliability of the missile. There is a possibility that North Korea could pursue MIRV technology and use decoys, which I think is a little bit probably more optimistic than American experts looking at. Uh, and so some of the kind of original analysis we found on the Chinese side is that it seems they do actually have their own count of North Korean missiles, which we at least could not find from any American or other sources. So US Department of Defense provides a count of North Korean missile launchers, uh, and that's been pretty consistent over time. But the Chinese instead provide a count of the actual missiles, not launchers. That seems reasonable, uh, but it's just different. It seems unique. It seems original. Uh, however, they don't provide any sources. So we don't really understand where they got this, how they got this. It was just basically a table they provided in an article. And so it's something worth considering, you know, whether uh, we think this is an accurate assessment of North Korean missiles uh, and whether this is actually revealing some kind of Chinese assessment of the actual North Korean arsenal in the real world. Similarly, what we found is looking at a range of Chinese articles representing an effort to track global missile testing every year 
over time that they do actually on their own count North Korean missile launches. So this is similar to other efforts in the US by CSIS or Monterey that tracks, attempts to track every North Korean launch that we know about. Uh, and there's a little bit of difference here, uh, enough to suggest that they really do do it on their own. Um, but if you actually look in the nitty gritty details of it, it seems that from what we can tell, they don't do a very good job. Uh, they miss launches or they count launches we think uh, were failures because of doctored North Korean imagery, they count as successes. Uh, and so overall, there's again, interest and efforts but the value for the community seems limited. Um, you know, looking at some of the articles, you actually see some really cool graphics that would suggest on first cut that this is representing original Chinese research on North Korean missile ranges on the left, missile design in the middle, and maybe something about, you know, warhead design on the right. But actually, if you're more familiar with the American literature, you realize that these are actually just completely stolen from a 38 North report, and they're just really good at Photoshop. Uh, and so we found that as quite an interesting twist. Um, and although this article did not even cite 38 North, you know, not a full citation, not a little citation, not an article name, not we got this from somewhere else, just zip, not a no citation, Actually, this provided a useful window to understand how these Chinese analysts can or cannot talk about North Korean missiles, because it was less plagiarization than it was actually just a straight translation. And so reading the full article side by side, what you could actually see is what they translated and what they didn't translate. And so you can notice that they avoided references to China as a source of North Korean tells, which we know from uh, open source analysis that, you know, China exported logging vehicles and North Korea then turned into TELS, uh, clearly, you know, sourced from China. They ignored that sentence in the 30 North report they plagiarized this from. Uh, Nathan, let me just interrupt you for a moment, just in case any of our audience are not familiar with what a TEL is, a transporter you. erector launcher, that would be a big truck that you could use to hoist a missile up and set it up for launch. So just in case any of our non-missile geeks on the line were wondering, that's what that is. Sorry, Nathan, please, read, no. please continue. Thanks, Scott. Yes. Uh, so China was the ultimate source, whether intentional or unintentional, of the infrastructure supporting North Korea's missile program. Uh, and these, this author just ignored that, you know, censored that out of the article. They also, also censored out references to the origins of North Korea's likely warhead design, which the 38 North article traced from China to Pakistan to North Korea, uh, and that was all gone. Um, but they even kept, just to show you that this was not a lackadaisical translation, they kept the joke of the article that said North Korea's poor missile performance could even mean that the missiles would, quote, fall back on North Korea. They kept the joke, so they thought it was funny, uh, but it really shows that there is some constraints on these analysts and the journals they publish in on what they can actually say about North Korea and China's role in it. Uh, we also know, looking at the specific analysts, that they can actually do real basic, at least, open source analysis because for the uh, US Ballistic Missile Defense System in South Korea, THAAD, the theater high altitude air defense system. Um, this analyst actually went on Google Maps and was able to pinpoint exactly where the THAAD was deployed and publish that. So it's not to say that they can't do basic uses of open source tools to do uh, you know, technical assessments, uh, but they just haven't elected to use that capability to assess North Korean missiles here. Uh, and so, Taking a step back and looking at this broad literature, you know, what is it, who is actually writing this literature and what does it mean for the Chinese policy process? And so we identified two broad buckets of Chinese authors. First are authors in the defense industry, mainly in this large uh, Chinese state-owned company called uh, the China Aerospace Science and Technology Corporation. I think it has probably 175,000 employees. It's huge, 
Uh, but what we found is that just a small slice of the organization is responsible for tracking global missile developments, uh, and they publish on North Korean missiles a lot. The other broad bucket of authors we found were from the Chinese military. Uh, we were able to identify some of them from the Chinese Missile Force, the Rocket Force Engineering Research Unit, which obviously means they're very familiar with missiles and how they go together. Uh, we also found evidence that the PLA Joint Staff Department Operations Command, which is basically their uh, operations and planning uh, organization, was writing on North Korean missiles. Uh, lastly, we found a article that we think was actually a pseudonym because the Chinese name never published any other article and the actual name of the author was a translation of a Korean term for a medieval Korean artillery launcher. So it seems that it was kind of an inside joke. Uh, we think it maybe was the kind of intelligence department of the Chinese military as a way to improve the overall discussion uh, within this you know, Chinese body of literature, but uh, we can't know for certain. And what we realized is that one important kind of group of authors that were missing that you really would think actually were focused on North Korean missiles was the Northern Theater Command, which is the Chinese military region that's focused on Korea contingencies and are surely responsible for planning against the small, you know, for their perspective, unlikely event that North Korea actually uses missiles against China. There was no analysis there. So ultimately looking at all this, understanding who these authors are, we realize that this analysis is intended to support, but not to drive the PRC policy process. This feeds up from way down in the weeds all the way up to inform decision makers but these articles are not intended to set or recommend policy to decision makers. Uh, and so really drawing from all this, reading all these articles, you know, what can we learn? What does it actually contribute to the broader uh, US and other you know, communities of research that do open source analysis of North Korean missiles? We would say you know, four broad uh, takeaways. First is that it does seem in small respects, Chinese analysts do some original analysis. So reading these articles, there was one article on North Korea's use of lattice fins for stabilization in the Musadan and the Pukuk Song 1 SLBM. Uh, we could not find any evidence that this was plagiarized or otherwise taken from American research. It wasn't in 30 North, not Arms Control Wonk, not NK News, not The Diplomat, nowhere else. Uh, and so we think this is original. Uh, it could be an inspiration for Chinese missile designs, could just be a researcher remarking on something interesting, uh, but that seemed original. So they can do this work. As I've said, uh, it really seems that they're constrained by what they can say or what they want to talk about. And that includes North Korean missile proliferation and impacts for other regional security issues. Uh, you know, early on, they talked about North Korean missile sales to Iran, to Libya, uh, elsewhere that could threaten Israel, but were marked with completely no concern. And they even cover the fact that North Korea has sold missiles to Vietnam and ignore the fact that these missiles could indeed be used against China in a South China Sea scenario. Uh, so, you know, proliferation to them is not a concern, it seems. And that also dovetails with broader Chinese efforts on North Korean proliferation. Uh, third is that these analysts, you know, although they don't write much on it, clearly they're not dumb and are indeed attuned to the broader geopolitical interests at play. Uh, and they do recognize occasionally that uh, North Korean provocations can drive uh, Northeast Asian regional security issues and provide an excuse to Japan to you know, become a normal country. And then lastly, I think of interest here is that uh, these Chinese analysts believe sanctions could actually be working on North Korean missiles. One article even said that uh, limited availability of precision guidance systems for North Korean missiles has driven North Korea to pursue a higher yield nuclear weapon to compensate for inaccuracies. And so taking the last step back, looking at implications, Scott, I welcome your thoughts on this as well. Uh, you know, again, to phone stop it, when reading these articles, it's very clear that PRC analysts are indeed constrained by the Chinese political environment. Uh, they really can't write freely. 
and they overlook some capabilities that otherwise would seem very noticeable and important to cover. Um, and they do not obviously want to talk about China's role in North Korea's program, whatever that might be. Uh, but framing it broadly in a geopolitical sense, uh, the fact that these articles exist and are continued and of some quality really reflects that China is indeed concerned about Korean Peninsula security issues, that it's uh, a major you know, planning site for the Chinese military. They're worried about what could happen. They're worried about the U.S. interests and the U.S. initiating a conflict on the peninsula. They're worried about stability. Uh, they know that North Korean missiles can be a part of that mix. Uh, and then lastly, going back to Scott's point, to start this all off, you know, how does Beijing think about North Korea as a threat to China? Does it look solely at the capabilities? Does it look solely at the political relationship? Or does it really take it all into account? And what we've seen and what we talked with other Chinese analysts, our conclusion is that uh, Beijing really does overlook the North Korea threat. Uh, it seems that it's not just about capabilities. And there's some less uh, faithful following of the Church of Realpolitik, uh, and they don't focus on the capability that really could harm China, like SRBMs uh, and shorter range systems that are very reliable, very pr proven, uh, and seem to be what a normal person in Beijing would be thinking about. And these analysts and the broader Chinese government clearly just don't want to think about it. Uh, and so with that, um, Scott, I'll welcome your thoughts. And I think we'll sure, open I'll, up. I'll, I'll make one or two quick comments and then Troy, maybe we can turn it over to uh, your questions in the audience too. So uh, just to kind of reinforce something you said, Nathan, I think you know historically uh, Chinese authors, or I should say PRC based authors uh, have historically underestimated whether, whether deliberately or out of um, you know, an underestimation of, of North Koreans uh, how quickly or whether North Korea would be able, for example, to build nuclear weapons. Uh, I can remember in the early to mid 2000s having numerous conversations with uh, Chinese experts on North Korea saying, well, they can never do what you Americans are saying they're going to do or what the, Kore the South Koreans are worried about. That's not, you're inflating the threat. Uh, and then lo and behold, it happens. I think that uh, the other point to make there, Nathan, and you said it, but I'll just uh, make it even more explicit is that as the PRC's, uh, you know, geostrategic thinking unfolds, I think one, one thing that this reveals and supports is that Chinese grand strategy is focused on the primary contradiction, which, which they perceive, which is the contradiction between China and the United States. Uh, whether this is informed by kind of classical Marxist dialectics or something from Chinese or Chinese communist political culture, I leave it to all of you to, to think about that, but I do think that the primary focus for, uh, for leaders in Beijing is to think about the implications of anything worldwide for China's competition with uh, the United States, which it regards as the only power that's really capable of impeding uh, Beijing's uh, ambitions or, or putting China at risk. Uh, maybe a final comment would be there's also a domestic sensitivity in China, as we know from, uh, from a lot of the other areas we've looked at. Um, quite clearly, uh, China has invested a lot in North Korea uh, over the past 70 years. It rescued the Kim regime. Uh, it has supported that regime over time. And so allowing a more open accounting of what China's connective tissues to that regime are or how North Korea might threaten China could be taken very logically as an implicit or potentially even an explicit criticism of past Chinese policy. And we know that the uh, the great, glorious, and always correct Chinese Communist Party doesn't make mistakes because they rely on uh, scientific Marxism. As a consequence, you can't have an open discussion, even uh, of technical issues, without uh, taking into account how that might fit into a domestic Chinese political mind. So, uh, Troy, with that, I think Nathan has unfolded uh, the research exceptionally well. Uh, we, I know you have, uh, just looking at the list of people, it's an amazing group of people who are listening. I'm honored by their presence, and I'm sure uh, they'll have some tough questions, but we'd like to start with you since I'm sure you've got tough questions too. So over yeah. to you. No, uh, thank you both. I think, you know, you did a really good job. It's a very interesting paper. And you actually, Scott, kind of touched on one of the first questions that Russ, end of your remarks that I was going to get at, which is sort of, you know, you can understand the political sensitivities of talking about some of the analysis side of things of why maybe North Korea is developing certain weapons, what they can be used to do and whether they would target China. But what sort of interests me is, you know, 
you know, I'll use contradiction maybe in a different sense here is the contradiction between there's clearly a desire to have an open source some technical analysis because they're taking it as Nathan said, you know, rewriting basically 38 North articles or other articles. But I guess to me, the interesting question is, is it, since, you know, the tail fin one, and this is what I think really stuck out to me when I first read the paper. Um, if you can do the analysis on the lattice tail fins, why are they not doing more of their own independent technical analysis? Forgetting about the context, just saying North Korea has tested X missiles. We believe these missiles have A, B, C, and D uh, capabilities. This is the tech in them. You know, do you think that, you know, that really is so politically sensitive because maybe that would get into sort of Chinese part sourcing or, you know, kind of what might be driving the need to have the technical information out there, but not to do it yourself? Yeah, I'll, let me offer one thought and then Nathan, I think you probably know better. But uh, one thing to say is let's remember that the relationship between Beijing and Pyongyang is highly sensitive for both sides too, right? So not only is there a concern about we don't want to reveal that our our defense industry is losing or or shipping deliberately things to North Korea, but also North Korea has made very clear to China that a lot of these things are hot button issues for the North. So whether it's return of refugees who must be classified as economic escapees through a secret agreement or other issues. Uh, if China starts publishing a lot on North Korea's weapon systems and became a legitimate source of information for the outside world, you can bet that Pyongyang would be unhappy about that. Um, so I think there's, that's one issue to highlight. But Nathan, maybe you've got some other thoughts you want to bring to the table on this. Yeah, no, thanks, Troy. I think you know the first part of the answer is that uh, you know we can only read the articles that are available, right? And so it certainly does not mean that even these same analysts in China aren't doing different, better, more interesting analysis that we wish we could read that is just internal, internally used, internally written. Uh, and that's possible, it's quite possible. Uh, you know, but I think the other part of the question is, you know, why don't we see, broadly speaking, uh, the same kind of, you know, open source analysis that we see in the US and other places in China, right? And I think the answer there is also pretty simple. It's that I would say two components. One is in the US, uh, a lot, not a lot, but you have some researchers who are from government and retire and have those skills and analytic capabilities who can apply that now publicly. There's a public interest in that. There's also a, a public government tolerance of that, whether it's agreement or in dissenting views of US government pronouncements. Uh, and so in China, there is not as much of a uh, analytic community that has sprung up. You know, there's no Monterey, uh, you know, to train people on how to do this. Uh, Chinese government clearly, especially under Xi Jinping, is not interested in having any kind of a private sector on this. You know, there are private sector Chinese defense think tanks in the sense that they are not officially, you know, under the Chinese government, but it's also very clear that one, they do work for the Chinese government or hold on the Chinese government. Uh, and that ultimately, whether you call it, you know, government or not government, it's still basically government, uh, especially on something so sensitive. And so uh, you just don't have that same community outside of government to provide this analysis. And then those in government, again, you know, just don't have the, uh, you know, freedom of speech in a sense to publish these analyses publicly. Uh, but, you know, talking with American researchers who have actually gone to China over the years and talked with not probably these specific people, but the, you know, small community in China that has these technical chops, government or otherwise, you know, government, uh, they say, yeah, really, if you actually talk to them, you know, they know their stuff, right? It's not that they don't actually have this information or have the analytical capabilities that simply, they just don't publish it publicly. And so, you know, I think that's probably the the biggest challenge you know what can they bring to the conversation it's not much because they're really constrained on what they can actually say uh, and the actual value of these articles then within china for the broader policy process is more what we describe as like a transmission belt right so it's obvious that these people who are translating this highly technical 30 north article have wonderful english skills right and so they can actually do this highly complicated translation to chinese and obviously you can empathize with the fact that not everybody in China speaks perfect English. And so this plagiarized article from 30 North is much more of a translation as a service to the broader community of taking this knowledge and saying, this is the best American experts have, and this is what they're thinking and providing that back to the broader Chinese policy community. 
I think that's really the role of these articles in helping inform the discussion within China, um, less so than actually, um, you know, uh, conducting original research. All right, let me just make one, one additional minor comment, and it goes to kind of how we did the research. Uh, first, I think it's worth bearing in mind for those of us of a certain age and above, uh, you know, China has had a flourishing of space or had a flourishing of space within the country for discussion of foreign affairs, which during the Mao years, the early Deng years, was, was all basically categorized as nationally security. National security was considered a sensitive issue and ordinary people had no business talking about foreign affairs, much less military affairs. And so some of the infrastructure that we see in South Korea today or the United States for this kind of uh, discussion and analysis, as Nathan said, does, doesn't exist for the technical reasons, but also because of historical sensitivities uh, inside of China. Uh, what has changed or what changed for a period of time at least was the emergence of kind of what we would term kind of military fanboy or for those who speak Japanese kind of otaku communities of geeks who really love defense issues and want to comment on it and talk about it and build model tanks and keep them in their offices or whatever aircraft. Um, and that's where when we did this research, you have a challenge as a researcher and Nathan really carried the bulk of this load to say, okay, you know, who are these researchers? We had, what was it, Nathan, 45, 50 articles, but I guarantee you if we had wanted to have kind of the military enthusiast community, we could have expanded it much larger, but then you're dealing with people who are not professionally trained, whose viewpoints don't really in some ways, you know, are, are almost as close to irrelevant as you can be. And so. Uh, for, for analysts out there, and many of looking at your participants list, many of them know this quite well, um, you know, trying to figure out whose writings are connected in any meaningful way to either the Chinese state or the PLA um, is a bit of a challenge. And I think it's one that Nathan in particular, you know, did a, a yeoman's work in trying to wade through and assign some kind of connective tissue between this author and this institution. Um, when some of the authors, you know, are obscure or may simply have been uh, people who, you know, read something but don't publish on missiles enough to say, yeah, you really know what you're talking about. So he, he really did a lot of work to try and figure out who knows what they're talking about here. And that's a challenge for uh, almost anyone working on any technical field in China today. And yeah, no, I know you, I, one of the things that I think struck me about the paper is, you know, Early on in my career, I went to a meeting with a government official and they basically said nothing in the meeting and I came out of it talking to my colleagues. And I think one of the best pieces of advice they gave me is that it was still a good meeting because what they didn't say is often just as important as what someone does say. And so I think knowing what the Chinese are willing to say, how they're willing to say it, you know, everything is in some ways just as maybe more important than if they were actually, you know, pumping out their own analysis. Um, so just as a reminder, I see there's some questions in the queue. If you have a question, please use the Q&A function. Um, I think because there are some there, I'm going to go ahead and turn uh, to that. Um, so, um, and also just uh, very briefly, I meant to say this at the top. Um, if you don't already have a copy of the paper, if you go to the event page on our website, there is a link where you can download the paper from there. So I please encourage you to do that because it is a very good paper that has a lot of insights as we've discussed so far today. Um, but so Jenny John asks, uh, did the Chinese develop independent surveillance infrastructure targeting North Korea's nukes over time? and or are most of these assessments affecting each other? Example, US looking at Chinese assessments and vice versa. And then also ask any data on differences between uh, what the Chinese observed versus what they decided to publish externally. That's probably a hard question to answer. It's a hard three questions and uh, Jenny, just for that, uh, we'll talk later. But yeah, Jenny, Jenny and Nathan and I are working on a separate issue right now. So she's posing some tough questions for us. We appreciate them though. There, um, I think, you know, as to uh, China's uh, ISR or intelligence surveillance reconnaissance uh, architecture that might observe and monitor uh, KPA uh, ballistic missile architecture. I, I don't think we spent any time, so I know I didn't spend any time specifically for this study looking at that issue. I think, you know, it's quite clear that over the last 30 years, uh, China has spent a lot of time building out its space-based infrastructure, uh, in part because China itself has moved dramatically into power projection through space with its own uh, ballistic and cruise missile launches, and it needs to target uh, primarily U.S. Uh, capital ships at sea or Taiwan or, or U.S. and Japanese bases or fad batteries in South Korea. Let's remember, 
Uh, one thing that I think for a South Korean audience you can take away from this paper is China is less worried about, at least publicly, less worried about uh, North Korea's ballistic missiles and nuclear weapons than it is a missile defense radar in South Korea. Um, so, you know, it's a, it's a very big tell in that sense. And I mean, tell as in reveal about their views as opposed to the tell that China shipped to North Korea, uh, that, you know, that China's uh, overarching geopolitical strategy is driving uh, their interpretation of capabilities as opposed to a worry about uh, capabilities. Um, as to whether or not uh, China has any other uh, ways to monitor or if uh, Chinese information is affecting the U.S. assessment or vice versa. I think, you know, obviously, Nathan, you would agree, uh, U.S. assessments are clearly being read in China. Uh, I don't know that we have uh, a lot of information about how U.S. experts might be drawing from Chinese analyses. And, you know, being honest, if we did, it would probably be in the classified realm and we wouldn't be talking about it in this setting. So Nathan, do you want to pick up there and, and answer the rest of Jenny's question? Sure. So uh, the one instance of Chinese assessments having an impact into the American conversation would be a, I want to say it's a 2014 or 2015 Wall Street Journal report that there was a private briefing from a Chinese nuclear scientist on North Korea's nuclear stockpile that was more optimistic than most American experts. Uh, it had a specific projection with specific numbers that seemed awfully credible. Uh, and Wall Street Journal reported it, um, you know, outside of the Chatham House rules that the conversation took place in. Uh, and that was quite interesting. That was really the first time that an independent Chinese assessment, at least to my knowledge, had been provided to Americans on North Korea's nuclear program. Uh, and immediately, the Chinese government and Chinese state run media denied it and basically said, oh, he's an old kook, don't listen to him. You know, he doesn't know what he's talking about. Oh, shucks, like we don't do that. Uh, and it was very clear that, you know, again, as Scott said, these issues are highly sensitive in Beijing uh, for many reasons. Uh, and although, you know, China has an interest in um, at some level dialoguing with the US on these, they really don't want anybody to know about it. And so um, whether those conversations take place is really difficult to discuss in a public setting, uh, but you know, occasionally they percolate out. Um, and I think broadly that reflects, you know, Chinese kind of intelligence collection capabilities. It would seem awfully silly for China to invest no effort, no resources into understanding North Korea's uh, WMD missile capabilities on its own. Um, you know, even if they broadly are less concerned with the political relationship, you know, it's just, it's, it's a nuclear, you know, power on your doorstep. Uh, you spend all this money on your military, you're not gonna spend a dime on understanding North Korea, that seems silly and seems highly improbable. Because again, uh, you know, these Chinese analysts may not publish exactly what we want them to, uh, but clearly, you know, they're not dumb in the Chinese military. Um, maybe a political military, but it's also, a, you know, very professional military. And so it, it's hard to believe that they would not actually invest those resources, broadly speaking. Yeah, and that's actually, you know, to go back to the table you showed earlier with the um, tests, uh, the North Korean ballistic missile tests and their counts and um, their analysis, that's what sort of struck me. I could see divergences on what we consider a successful test and maybe what they consider successful tests. But the divergence in the numbers actually, you know, surprised me when I first saw it because you would think, all right, you know, these things tend to be announced in the news and everything. And so that would suggest either that one, they were aware and not aware of a test that was not publicly announced um, or that, you know, something else was going on. You know, why would you have a discrepancy in something to where, you know, basically every world, you know, news outlet is saying three missiles of, were shot this far. And, you know, basically every country is looking at it with their radar and the North Koreans are sometimes, you know, putting out images of at least the initial launch phase. So. Um, so another question, and um, this is from an anonymous attendee. Um, did you observe any articles that could support uh, the D that the DPRK intended to implement a deterrence with its weapons of mass destruction? Would that be a deterrence against China? Uh, it just says uh, deterrence uh, with its WMD in general. 
Uh, sure. So I think um, Chinese analysts, um, you know, again, don't comment much on the kind of geopolitical nature of the missile program. They're usually, you know, pretty dry technical articles, but uh, every so often that does come through. And uh, yes, you know, they, they seem to certainly understand it's not hard to arrive at that conclusion that North Korea's program uh, does have a deterrence um, purpose for it. Uh, and, you know, I think there was one article by a pretty prolific, relatively prolific Chinese analyst that said, you know, North Korea's tests are meant to tell the U.S. your sanctions aren't working, you know, we have, you know, we have this capability, don't mess with us. Uh, and so whether or not they use the specific term deterrence, you know, it's very clear that Chinese analysts understand the purpose of the program uh, and that it is indeed intended to, uh, you know, deter U.S. action. And from this perspective, again, another one of those reasons that uh, the China-North Korea relationship is special is because, at least in some quarters in Beijing, there is empathy for North Korea's plight. And it's really framed in that manner, right? It's that uh, you have this uh, overbearing, militaristic, angry, you know, provocative superpower, you know, banging down your door every time, you know, trying to force you to do something you don't want to do. And all you're trying to do is just defend yourself and, you know, have the regime you want in a safe country. Uh, and, you know, you're trying to develop a nuclear program as a way to avoid, you know, stop nuclear blackmail from the U.S., and that was a lot of the same rhetoric that China employed under Mao as it developed its nuclear program. There are definitely some similarities uh, and analogies there, whether they're made explicit or not, when you read Chinese analyses on North Korea. Pity poor North Korea, so far from heaven, so close to the United States. But I think that you know yeah. the, the alternative uh, interpretation here of the question that was posed um, and I think it's going to get us, hopefully, to a question Jonathan Pollack posed in the chat function, Troy, that I'd like to make sure we address, too. Uh, but is, to what extent might Chinese analysts recognize uh, North Korean capabilities as relevant for deterring China? Um, and I think there, you know, first of all, again, not, you know, limiting ourselves to what we looked at for this paper, I would say, Nathan kind of made it clear, Really, these are very technical analyses. They are not about the broader relationship. They're not even about the broad geopolitical context in which the relationship exists. They generally tend to be fairly narrowly focused on what are these missiles capable of, what are their ranges, what technical features do they have. Um, but I think read in a broader context, certainly uh, it is the case that um, Chinese uh, capabilities and China's modernization. And to Jonathan's question about, you know, is North Korea worried about Chinese assertiveness? Is China being less assertive to North Korea than it was uh, in almost any other part of the world? I think it's possible to say, you know, look at the timing of North Korea's rapid development of its military capabilities. It's a little bit hard to disentangle, right? Xi Jinping comes to power in the fall of 2012, early 2013, right as North Korea suddenly ramps up its own missile development. Um, I don't think it's fair to say that in any sense, North Korea's uh, missile development is driven by a fear of China exclusively, uh, nor that it's purely defensive. Certainly North Korea is aggressive, could potentially use its missiles uh, for coercion as a shield behind which to carry out cyber or conventional strikes on the South, Japan, or even the United States. Um, but those capabilities, whether Chinese analysts acknowledge them or not, do have a potential deterrent implication for China. And as we've talked about many times before in other contexts, if a North Korean partial collapse were to occur, it's possible and many analysts would assess possibly even likely that China might intervene in North Korea. North Korea is a highly nationalistic, xenophobic, anti anyone who's not Korean regime and would want to have the capacity to deter even a large power that they are highly dependent upon. All the garbage about you know, self-reliance and Juche aside, we all know North Korea is hugely dependent on China and wants to be able to deter China from, uh, from acting assertively against North Korea. The other half of Jonathan's question, if I can just go there, is, uh, Troy, is that I think you know, China- oh, Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, I, I just think that um, you know, China has been very assertive vis-a-vis -vis North Korea. It did warn Pyongyang that no one can create trouble on China's doorstep. 
But because China seeks a divided Korea where both Pyongyang and Seoul are dependent on and look to Beijing as a source of influence to moderate the other or to try to provide support and sustenance and a shield against US, Japanese, or Korean, uh, South Korean efforts, um, for that reason, uh, you go away. I'm on a phone call right now. Sorry, boys. You can't talk to me right now. I feel like I just had my own moment like uh, that CNN, a guy on CNN a few years ago. Um, so yeah, I think it's highly uh, likely that Beijing has sought to try to retain influence in both Seoul and Pyongyang uh, by trying to keep North Korea on a leash, however long that leash might be, while at the same time signaling to Seoul that, look, we're not going to help you on North Korea necessarily right now, but if things ever got really bad, we might, and therefore you'd better not get too close to the Americas. Jonathan, I don't know if that answers your question fully, uh, and I'm sure uh, Nathan has additional thoughts he'd like to bring to bear, but that kind of is what's, what, what came to mind for me. If on Jonathan's two questions, Nathan, and uh, you know, maybe I'll just go through and read them both real quick so uh, everyone else has a better context. Uh, well, actually, they're in the chat function, sorry, which everybody should be able to see. Uh, so Nathan, yeah, if you had any additional comments on that? Sure. So I think, you know, again, getting to this kind of perennial question about Chinese risk assessments of North Korea, right? And I would broaden that to Korea issues, you know, because again, at least from my perspective, when Beijing looks at risks of war on the Korean Peninsula, usually they're looking at, they assume that any conflict will be U.S. initiated. Uh, and it may be because of North Korean provocations, but the you know, burden of responsibility in Chinese writings most often falls on the U.S. as an initiator of a future conflict. But the, you know, prep, the public preparations we saw for Korean contingencies around tensions in 2017 were pretty high profile, uh, you know, both revealing Chinese effort for deterrence. Against, as Scott said, both North Korea and the U.S., you know, Xi Jinping's quote uh, in 2013 was evidently applied to everyone, uh, including Seoul. Um, you know, just don't mess it up. Don't anybody do anything stupid um, and plus everybody. And so, you know, very high profile coverage of Chinese uh, military exercises near North Korea during tensions were clearly intended to demonstrate to all parties concerned that China has the capabilities needed uh, and that, you know, it will execute the missions it desires to, if it so chooses, right? Uh, and I think Oriana Mastro's paper in International Security, that Scott was alluding to, uh, you know, did a pretty good job walking through uh, open source, you know, public Chinese military writings on this growing ambition for a Korea contingency to actually uh, execute in missions inside of North Korea, which is a change of pace from writings, you know, 10 years ago that were much more about stopping the consequences of the conflict at the border and limiting it from washing into China. And now it's actually talking about the Chinese military leaving the country, going into North Korea for various missions, including nuclear a WMD seizure, uh, which is a, a pretty big one. Uh, and I think, you know, looking at the broader reorganization of the Chinese military in 2015, again, the inclusion of, you know, Shandong in the Northern Theater Command, it's getting kind of technical, but um, I think it's, it's quite evident that China really does think about Korea scenarios uh, as a high risk for China. They have strong memories of the Korean War. They talk about it all the time. Uh, so that really is a factor in their thinking there. Yes. Thanks. So we have a question from Charles Herman. Uh, asks, do Chinese analysts discuss possible responses by US, South Korea, and or Japan to ballistic missile programs in North Korea? I mean, I think that's a, a very easy uh, answer, absolutely. Uh, although they um, tend to look very closely at the implications for China of US, South Korean and Japanese responses. Uh, one of the primary concerns for China is to prevent the emergence of a regional theater or ballistic missile shield, maybe even a, a Broadway, all the way up to a national missile defense in the United States that might be interlinked to sensors and interceptors across Northeast Asia that might have the uh, proximate cause uh, of being spurred by North Korea, but might ultimately have consequences for China's own, uh, at least ground launched, potentially even air launched uh, ballistic missiles. Uh, 
Uh, and so, yes, there's certainly a concern there. Uh, I think the, the questioner was perhaps also wondering about, you know, the consequences of a war. Uh, and there may be, Nathan, you want to say something about, you know, how U.S. responses to North Korea uh, might, might be seen in Beijing. Again, this, is a, this mostly goes beyond what was covered in the paper, which is largely technical analysis, but it does, it does all feed into the larger organic set of questions we're all interested in. I think Scott hit it on the head. They see it through a kind of U.S. centric geopolitical consequences lens that North Korean actions provide top cover and excuse for uh, U.S. increased presence and cooperation with South Korea and Japan and an excuse for Japan to um, take, you know, a trajectory on its defense policy that China doesn't want, which is becoming, a, you know, a normal country with the military, with you know, uh, robust self-defense capabilities, potentially offensive strike. Uh, and for Chinese analysts, they worry a lot about the Japanese nuclear program. All of these things can be justified upon the threat from North Korea, whether or not from a Chinese perspective that they're targeted at China. The Chinese analysts, again, aren't dumb. They're very attuned to that. Uh, and that's probably their number one criticism of North Korean actions is that it's not actually North Korean behavior that's a problem. It's the second order consequences it enables or drives that is the blowback for Beijing. Okay. We have time for maybe one more question. Um, there's one more in the chat uh, that I think I'll go to. It's from Joe. Uh, did you detect any PRC understanding of North Korean CCD activities with regards to its ballistic missile programs? So for anyone on the call who's not, uh, again, living in the world of Pentagonese uh, acronyms, CCD would be cover, concealment, and denial. In other words, efforts by North Korea to uh, mislead outside observers to hide their ballistic missile infrastructure to move it covertly. Um, again, Nathan, you looked at the uh, the writings by Chinese authors the most closely. I, I think, if I recall correctly, we didn't really talk about that, but maybe you want to answer this one uh, in detail. Uh, right. So I didn't see any articles specifically on that topic. Uh, obviously, that if North Korea was innovating in that space, broadly speaking, then China would surely be interested in that uh, to learn from for themselves. Uh, something, you know, China is very focused on doing in its own missile force. Uh, but, you know, North or Chinese analysts remarked upon it in the sense of the survivability of North Korea's missiles, right? And saying, you know, the Pukuksong 2 MRBM is a more optimal platform for deterrence because it's solid fueled and thus you know, comes out of the tunnel quicker and is ready to launch uh, and is better able to actually, uh, you know, be deployed in North Korea's mountainous regions, which is the majority of the country. Um, so I don't think it's a major focus for them, but, you know, it's something they are probably aware of. And again, to Troy's first question, you know, we can only talk about the analysis that they've published publicly. Uh, it's also totally possible that this something the, North, the Chinese analysts are focused on because again, to Oriana's paper, you know, there might be a Chinese desire or preparation for actually seizing those missiles and they wanna be able to find them in a contingency. So, you know, it seems quite possible that they would be at least thinking about what North Korea is doing for CCD. Well, I'd just like to thank you both again and to everyone watching, uh, once again, please download the paper. It's uh, on the event page for the website uh, on our homepage. And with that, um, thank you both. This has been a really great discussion.